Hello everyone and welcome to the IFSD webinar, Ideation That Works and Virtually, organized by the Food Innovation Special Interest Group. My name is Valia Christidou and I am the communications lead for, for, the, for the group. The Food Innovation Special Interest Group is now in its second full year. We started this year with a webinar on the innovation process that was the six size of innovation. Then in March, we visited Oxford University's exhibition, Meet the Future. That was together with IFSD's Midlands branch. We wrote a review on the exhibition in June's Food Science and Technology magazine. Uh, this year, we also started work on an innovation toolkit that will benefit all our members. Uh, and we presented our ambition in September's issue of, the, again, the Food Science and Technology magazine. So we are now closing the year with a masterclass on ideation. We all know that innovation is the lifeblood of many food and drink companies. Yet often innovation workshops can be at best exhausting and at worst disengaging, especially if they are conducted virtually. In this webinar, our speaker will share practical best practice learnings of what really works when you're running an idea session uh, online. Uh, and I will not say anything uh, else uh, about this, except that I think we are all in for a treat today. So this webinar is uh, being recorded and will be uploaded to IFST's webinar, uh, webinar hub. Feel free to make comments and ask questions throughout this, the webinar using the Q&A button you will find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also upvote other people's questions by clicking the like button next to the question. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation where we will try and respond to as many uh, questions as possible. Our speaker today is Coral McConnell. Coral is a front-end innovation consultant working with global and local clients on sticky, tricky innovation challenges that require fresh thinking. She has worked on innovation on projects of over 40 brands across a number of se sectors, including FMCG, pharma, uh, finance, spanning the world. She is on a mission to en ensure that innovation pro projects always deliver. Uh, Coral designs the innovation sprint, she creates stimulus to stretch uh, thinking and leads productive and creative innovation sprints. She is endlessly curious about how we can help people play the, the, the creative A game. And to this end, uh, she is completing a master's in creativity. So for more information on, on our speaker's biography, please uh, check the IFSD website. And with this, I will hand over to Coro. Brilliant. Thanks, Valia. And big good morning to everyone. I'm really delighted to be spending the next uh, remainder of the hour with you covering off ideation that works. And look, before we, we get started, I think it's worth pausing just for a moment to reflect on what ideation feels like when it works. And, you know, it is a thing of beauty. Ideas are flowing, there's a self-generating energy, you're creating disruptive ideas that perhaps exceed your wildest expectations. And you're in a state that um, Mahali, sits in Mahali, uh, refers to as creative flow. However, um, we all know perhaps what it feels like when ideation doesn't work. It's hard work, the connections don't spark, people get frustrated, things get derailed, and it's really hit or miss with an emphasis, sadly, on the miss. Um, and, you know, the sad thing there is it uh, creates and then reinforces a view for people that the ideation is a bit unreliable, it might work, it might not. And so our purpose today is really to explore ideation that works each and every time reliably, so you're always getting to results. Now, with that in mind, um, as Valia has mentioned, um, I'm really, really interested in the way our brains work when we're creating ideas. 
And really importantly, what are the practical things we can do to help people play their creative A game? So over the course of today, I'm going to cover off some of the core principles that are important when we're designing innovation ideation uh, workshops and also cover off five really practical things we want to get right. And then finally, at the end, I'm going to touch on how that varies when we're looking at virtual engagements. So with that in mind, I'm going to pop some slides on screen and we will get started. So our objective for today, as we've talked about how we can get to ideation that works every time, and I mean absolutely every time. And of course, works also in a virtual environment. And I think, you know, the headline on virtual is actually it's not that different. There's just a few things that we really need to dial up. So the game plan, we're going to look at the um, start at some of the feedback that people submitted in advance in terms of your ideation highlights and perhaps uh, less honourable uh, ideation experiences, as well as your expectations for today. We'll jump into best practice ideation, five really practical points, how do we do it? We'll then end, as I mentioned, um, talking about virtual um, and with 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So to start with, some of the things that you called out, and a big thank you to the people that engaged in advance. Um, some of the things you called out in terms of your expectations for today on the left, really interested in team unity and focus, how to be more disruptive in thinking, and an appetite for tools and techniques. And what you told me was when ideation's at its best, it's clear, we're moving at speed, we're focused, there's an environment that supports our ideas. However, as we've said, when ideation isn't at its best, you're lacking the clarity up front. No one knows what's expected of them. We're not united. We get off track and we start seeing really disruptive behaviors um, starting to come out. And perhaps, you know, projects that aren't even designed with some of the really, really important factors in terms of what's in scope, out of scope, legislation being an example. And so we're going to explore a lot of these um, factors today. So to start with, we're going to think about best practice ideation, some of the core principles before we jump into the practical factors. Now, before we do that, I've got a question for you and a poll will appear on screen. How clear are the objectives for a typical innovation project in your business? You've got 30 seconds, select the option that works best for you. And those answers will appear for us on screen after the 30 seconds, Robin will pop them up for us. So this is really interesting. Um, and, and thanks to everyone who's answered there. Uh, one person saying, okay, they're razor sharp. We nail it every time. I mean, that that's just sensational. The majority of people saying reasonably clear, but hey, we could do a bit better. And um, a not inconsiderable chunk of people, a third saying, actually not clear. We need, really need to work on this one. Um, thanks, Robin. If we can pop that off screen, that's great. Amazing. So guys, you know, I think the, the, um, the headline here is my experience, certainly across a range of industries is lack of clarity at the start of a project and perhaps a lack of clarity that permeates the project is sadly not a rare thing. And I think, you know, I would ask that that's really one of the big takeaways out of today is that clarity in terms of objectives and what we want to achieve is absolutely essential in getting to ideation that works. It stops people getting excited about perhaps bright and shiny tools and techniques that might be completely divorced from what their actual objectives are. And so we're going to explore that a bit further. And certainly in the conversations I'm having with clients, you know, I would... 
want to interrogate a number of objectives. First of, first of all, what are the commercial objectives behind the project? So strategic priorities. What do we need to bear in mind in terms of stakeholder alignment? What do we want in terms of short-term, medium-term, long-term um, outputs to support the innovation roadmap? And then within that, what are the collaboration um, objectives we might have in terms of cross-functional participation, having people um, participating not only internally, but from outside of our own company, um, perhaps looking at agency partners, looking at consumers, other co-creators, and, and really, really embedding a sense of ownership about the project. And then finally, what are some of our creative or creativity objectives in terms of the level of mindset change, the level of disruptive thinking, really broadening people's horizons outside of our own categories and our own world, um, and actually building creative capability of the team. And of course, that Goldilocks point um, is when we've got clarity on all of our objectives, um, and we can take that clarity then forward into designing um, our innovation, our ideation work. And what's really important as we then move into designing our ideation work, and this is really, if you like, the second big takeaway, is the discipline of um, separating divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And look, I know there's a heap of people on the call who have probably got a lot of experience um, innovating, ideating. And, you know, what's, what's really important here is that our divergent thinking, when we're creating lots of ideas, we've got the space to explore those ideas before we then pivot and move into starting to prioritize and hone those ideas. And I find it really helpful um, to think about this visually. Once we're clear on our challenge at the start of the diamond, we then move into thinking divergently, exploring lots of ideas, lots of different combinations, all in the service of our challenge. We've got clarity on what's in scope and what's out of scope. And then we pivot and we take that pool of ideas we start prioritizing them, crafting, honing, iterating, and then developing action plans to support them. And finally, we get to our potential solutions. And there's an American um, creativity academic, George Land, who I think has quite an interesting analogy here. And he talks about the importance of separating divergent thinking and convergent thinking by using an, the analogy of a car. And what he says is when we're thinking divergently, that's a bit like putting our foot on the accelerator. When we're thinking convergently, that's a bit like putting our foot on the brake. You know, there's a time and a place when it's absolutely the right thing to do. But you cannot, cannot, cannot drive a car by having your foot on both the accelerator and the brake. It's a recipe for making no progress. So I find that quite a nice analogy. We want complete focus. We are thinking divergently at the very beginning of the process, and then we pivot into thinking convergently. And to help support that, there are some best practice behaviors that are really, really important, not only to introduce, uh, but also to give people experience of, and also to reinforce throughout the project, um, or perhaps a workshop. Our brains are hardwired to look for the path of least resistance. So these guidelines help keep us honest. So let's take a look at them. First of all, from a divergent thinking perspective, we want to avoid premature judgment. Two really important reasons why we want to do this. One, we want to avoid prematurely judging our own ideas and therefore not offering up an idea or a fragment of an idea that might then be a spark or a, a creative catalyst for other people we're ideating with. And the second reason, of course, is we don't want to kill off other people's ideas. So much more productive to put our cognitive energy into genuinely being curious and saying, well, hey, that is kind of interesting. And maybe if we take that a little bit further, you know, we, we could build this onto it or explore that avenue. So avoiding premature judgment. The second guideline, building on other people's ideas. 
And, you know, why that's really important for us is if perhaps I volunteer an idea that Valia then builds on, that Susan then picks up and builds on further, that Robin then picks up and builds on further, you can see in the space of three or four iterations, we've collectively created something that where the sum of the parts um, is, is greater than the whole, uh, what our collective efforts and the fact we're constantly building means we're exploring new directions. Now, the third point here, seek novelty. I often see people come into projects and then they play it really, really safe about in terms of the ideas they're exploring, even though the stimulus and the tools are stretching them to think further. When you're ideating, that is the time to explore the fringes, the ideas that are slightly uncomfortable. Because, you know, I'm sure everyone can relate to the fact it's so, so much easier to take a slightly wild idea and maybe rein it in a little bit later than taking an idea that is dull and unambitious and trying to give it CPR later in the process. And then finally, go for quantity. Now, this is a really interesting one in that intuitively we're probably all sitting here thinking well actually no thanks on the quantity I just want a couple of really good quality ideas and of course quantity is simply a means to an end to get to quality what happens when our brains are making fresh connections and creating new ideas the first third of our ideas tend to be the really obvious stuff uh, top of mind stuff and really we want to purge that and just get it out of the way the next third of ideas tend to start perhaps getting a little bit sillier and you know it's very tempting to think well okay that's it that's enough let's call it quits here but the final third of ideas are when we start getting really really interesting conscious and unconscious connections starting to occur and where we're most likely to strike gold. So go for quantity is really, really important because that helps get us to a big pool of ideas that we're then later able to reshape, combine, synthesize, and where we really strike gold. And equally, when we pivot into convergent thinking, there's some really important best practice guidelines there. One, keep our goals in mind. The strategic red thread that we've established at the start of the project should not be lost. We want to come back and relook at what's in scope, what's out of scope for the innovation territories we're exploring. So we've got that top of mind as we filter ideas. And of course, we want to give new options a chance. It might be we need to take a step back, look at the pluses, look at the concerns we have and the potential of ideas and improve those options. Um, this discipline and convergent thinking is really, really important because often people will get to the end of ideation and go, hooray, you know, we've got a great pool of ideas, amazing job done. But actually, um, only half the work is done because once we've created the pool of ideas, the hard work of them prioritizing those ideas, crafting and iterating those concepts, you know, simply cannot be neglected. And so that's a really, really important thing to remember to design into your process. Okay, so with all that in mind, how do we actually go about creating um, ideation sessions that deliver each and every time. So I think the first thing to think about here is what is creativity? Um, is it something that only people from ad agencies with the word creative director in their title perhaps can do? Um, is it something that's slightly esoteric and maybe unobtainable? Well, actually, the answer is, is, is no. It's something that's very obtainable for everyone. And creativity at its heart is simply combining new and existing information in new ways to get to novel outcomes. So with that in mind, let's take a look at five factors that help us very practically ensure that we are helping people play their creative A game and the ideation will deliver each and every time. So as I go through each of these factors, I'm going to touch briefly 
on what's the creative principle and then we're going to look at pragmatically or using pragmatism how do we bring each of these things alive and just to call out there will be a checklist that we'll distribute at the end of the session which will cover off a lot of these points so the very first point is around creating space for deep thinking and the creativity principle that's at play here is that we need dedicated time for deep thinking so we can start to make connections between new information and existing information in our memories to create new ideas and we need to create that time for us as individuals as well as a team participating in the process and look we only need to think to the fact you know we all have very high workloads we may be working in organizations with reduced headcount there therefore everyone um, is is actually picking up more work that the challenge is to find dedicated thinking time for ideation and of course the temptation is to cut corners and so when we really, really understand the principle that's important, it enables us to make the right choices to ensure we get um, to sessions which, which allow us to think really deeply. So five practical tips here. The very first is create the expectation. This is about 100% focus. You don't want people who are popping in in between meetings, um, popping out again, um, because they're not able to concentrate properly and they're disrupting the work that everyone else is doing. So that's a really important expectation to set. This is about 100% focus. You know, research tells us uh, multitasking does not work. Um, so, you know, let's face into that fact and ensure we are focused. Now, the second thing to call out is we deliberately want to create time for people to start incubating ideas even before the first ideation session. Now, this to me is a super exciting area. And I think it's one area where virtual and over the pandemic, the fact you know that all of our ideation and innovation sessions were run virtually has really helped us reconnect with best practice. And what this means is ensuring that we're briefing people in advance of the live sessions, we're giving them stimulus to digest, we're getting them to start incubating ideas, and when we actually get to the room um, or we get to the Zoom call uh, that we will be ideating on, the quality of the outputs is so much better because people have already been mulling over and incubating ideas. Now, something else to call out here is we also need to be cognizant of the fact we want a mix of different ideation exercises. I think there's a tendency when we're running workshops that everything ends up being a big group exercise or uh, where we're working in innovation squads, which of course is best practice, squads of no more than five people with a cross-functional mix. Um, you know, we want not only to have the squad ideating as a whole, but we want some exercises where individuals are able to ideate and really engage in very deep inward looking attention to start creating some deep connections and then come back together as a group. So that balance of group exercises and individual exercises is a really, really important one to consider. Now, also something else that I think virtual has been great for reminding us about is really in the perfect world, do you want to put people together for a one or a two day innovation or ideation session? Or do you want to maybe space some of those sessions out over time? So there's more time for reflection in between some of the bigger chunks, perhaps of ideation, idea prioritization and articulation, concept crafting, and iteration through um, using techniques like consumer test and learn. And finally, we want to create a seamless experience with all the logistics taken care of. And look, it's easy to look at this and say, hey, Coral, of course, we get it. 
But actually, I often find people fail to appreciate the impact that having slightly rocky logistics that really aren't nailed has on the creative climate. Because we want people in a mindset that, hey, we're clear on our objectives, we're clear on the way how the process is structured, what we need to do at different points in time. And we know what input's required of us. So people can relax and they can concentrate on creating, combining, playing with ideas when we've not got the right um, kit for breakout exercises, we've not got the printing done, sessions are running late, all those sorts of things take people's focus off what the actual task is. And that's having them play their creative A game. So that preparation in advance to ensure none of those details get in the way is absolutely essential. And in my experience, you know, often overlooked. So that's the first area we're looking at. We want to make sure we're creating space for deep thinking. We've designed sessions. We've got time in people's calendars to support that. And the second thing to think about is really embracing diversity. And here the principle is all about ensuring we've got great diversity of thinking in our innovation team. And that's for two reasons. One is ultimately it will allow us to create more robust ideas. It also, really importantly, it helps with the ownership of those ideas, which of course, you know, ultimately will need to be implemented in the business. So a couple of practical things we can do here. Number one is inviting a mix of people across different functions, but also people with different experience. Perhaps, for example, folk who've worked outside of the company for longer than they've worked inside of it. So they might have a more um, broader view, if you like, of the outside world. And considering not only internal folk, but folk from externally um, outside of the company as well. So for example, that might be agency partners, um, like perhaps strategic planners from your advertising agency would be a really great example. So a second thing to consider here is engaging with different stakeholders in different ways. I often see people falling into the trap of thinking, we've got to invite absolutely everyone to the workshop. And actually, that, that's not correct. And it's actually counterproductive. So, you know, a few things to consider here. Are there senior stakeholders who, yes, we want them involved. We want them, of course, as we're signing off um, key elements of the project to be involved in that process. So we've got their sign off and their support. But perhaps their role is joining the start of the project to talk about the strategic importance of the work we're doing and maybe joining at the end, perhaps in a Dragon's Den style presentation of some of the key concepts, the innovation roadmap that's been created. Equally, let's be honest, there are some people who just often don't play nicely with others. And if that's the case, for whatever reason, you know, these people may still have really great inputs that we want to capture. So let's be open minded about different ways of engaging with them. It might be about getting their input, perhaps getting them to run a, a session in the workshop, um, but not join the whole session and give their feedback. Um, after the end of ideation, uh, perhaps, or input into prioritization. So I think the big message here is one size does not fit all, and more people is not always the, the right approach. Generally, um, I would have people in an innovation or an ideation session, as I've mentioned, working in innovation squads of no more than five people. And I would often have multiple squads running in parallel, which are exploring different innovation territories or unmet consumer needs to make sure we're doing a good job of doing um, deep due diligence on the challenge. So the next point here is around embracing positive conflict. If you get to the workshop and you've got people standing up and saying, well, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what we were focusing on. Um, there's no reason why we should be focusing on this objective. That's totally not important. It's off strategy. 
then we can be pretty clear at that point we've not done a good enough job up front of engaging comprehensively with stakeholders because what we want to do is flush out all of that positive conflict what's on strategy what's off strategy what is important in this moment uh, and what is not as important and engaging with senior stakeholders on those issues before we even get to the ideation session and when we do that we actually flush out positive conflict different points of view that we need to consider to ensure the project is going to be set up for success so the reminder there is ensure we're doing that in advance of the sessions now here's another interesting one managing difficult behaviors often people ask me about this and how we manage difficult behaviors or difficult people and I think the headline here is it's not the people who are difficult they're not inherently difficult it's their behaviors and often people exhibit difficult behaviors because they feel like perhaps they are disengaged they've not been listened to they've not been able to input they don't feel like they've had a meaningful role to play so look a lot of those issues we take care of when we're aligning at the start of the project engaging with key stakeholders, giving people clarity in advance of the workshop, how it's going to work, what their role is, what's expected of them, and creating some energy and excitement and buzz and really getting people engaged. Now, of course, you know, every so often there might be people who are exhibiting behaviors in the workshop that might derail the session or are, are taking energy out of the room, my advice is deal with that really promptly and respectfully in the moment. So if it's about people creating ideas that are out of scope, you've already aligned on pre-workshop what's in scope. So you're able to say, hey, it's an interesting idea. Let's put it in the car park. It's out of scope for what we're discussing today. Let's make sure it's not missed, but let's focus in on today's challenge. Uh, difficult behaviors is, is something that, you know, there may be appetite around um, from Q&A. And if you've got additional questions on that, you know, really happy to engage with those um, later on. And so the final point here is do think about co-creation. How is it that we might want to involve consumers in the process? I think one watch out on co-creation with consumers is we don't need the consumer physically or, or virtually with us every step of the journey. We'll start the project being really grounded in consumer unmet needs. Uh, and there at different points. So for example, maybe when we get to some first ideas, we might bounce those off consumers for directional feedback when we get to crafted concepts with clarity around the insight the benefit the reason to believe maybe a visual representation at that point you know we might bounce those concepts off consumers what are their overall impressions their likes their dislikes what would they change what doesn't ring true so co-creation uh, with consumers with provocateurs is a really powerful tool but one we need to use choicefully So I'm going to get you to, to reflect briefly before we jump into the next area, which is designing for a shift in perspective on a question. And this question and the poll will pop up onto screen. When you ideate in your business, do you get to disruptive ideas? And the answers to choose from always, every time sometimes but it's not reliable and the third answer is very seldom and it's the same drill guys we've got around about 30 seconds and then we'll look at those answers on screen so we've had two folks say always every time so kudos you know that that's brilliant things are obviously working and you're ideating and innovating in a best practice way for the majority of people, I think the reality is, is as you know, the we've proven out with with the second and third um, answers here. Sometimes, but it's not reliable, and and also very seldom. So, look, let's explore some of the things that are really helpful in getting us to disruptive ideas, assuming that we've got number one, the clarity on what our objectives are. 
Number two, that we have created the space for deep thinking, that we've got a diverse group of people brought together. The next area we want to focus on is how do we design for that shift in perspective? And so if we could just take the answers off screen, that's amazing, thank you, and we will take a look at that. So designing for a shift in perspective is really, really important. Um, and here we need to think about inspiring stimulus and tools that really help us break free of our creative blocks. And, you know, often we'll all suffer from functional fixedness. And that's where we look at a problem or we look at a concept through one set of eyes from only one perspective and we're kind of blind if you like to what some of the other um, ways of viewing the situation or viewing a particular idea are and so we really want to take those blinkers off so what are the practical ways we can do that so a heads up there are two of them um, there's a really important question to ask with each of them so the first thing to call out is we want to use a variety of creative stimulus. It's not enough to hope that people will have enough in their heads going into the room to be able to create disruptive ideas. And the reason for that is because we talked about earlier, the time pressures all of us are under, the reality is we're probably not doing or spending enough time looking at the outside world, being inspired by science, the arts, culture, um, and giving us all of those rich data points that really might help us um, innovate and ideate more broadly. So we do want to help people with that and give them creative stimulus to help them on that journey. The very first question to ask is a really important one. What are the key aspects of the challenge we're going to bring alive? And there we want to refer back to our objectives. What is the perhaps the consumer unmet need or the innovation territory we're exploring? And that then helps inform the techniques and then tools we use. Often I see people uh, perhaps who get a little bit distracted by a bright, shiny new tool or technique, and they really forget to ask the question, what are my objectives? What am I seeking to achieve? Because when you've got clarity on that, then selecting the types of creative stimulus that will make sense, and then the types of ideation tools and techniques that make sense is easy. So some of the uh, techniques we can use for creative stimulus, and there's a mix here, a lot of these are actually very low budget. So first of all, if we're seeking to explore consumer unmet needs, can we use friends and family interviews? Can we use adjacent category examples? Uh, maybe send people on safaris so their living life as consumers would live to give them greater empathy around consumer needs. Can we use multisensorial stimulus? <clears throat> excuse me, to bring alive different aspects of the challenge from a touch, taste, smell, etc. perspective. And then asking the question, um, and these are uh, slightly more, or this particular example, slightly higher budget, engaging with provocateurs. So, you know, depending on the innovation challenge, a recent functional foods challenge I had, we engaged with uh, nutritionists, we had high performance sports experts, um, and we had a biohacker join us to give us some really fresh perspectives on the way to view the challenge. And of course, making good use of science and technology stimulus from within the business, the caveat there being it needs to be lay person friendly, so it's easy to digest. And then the second point here, creative tools to help stretch our thinking and asking that really important question again, what are we seeking to achieve? Some of the tools we can use, um, combinatory tools like Scamper to move thinking further out, analogous thinking tools, um, personal analogies, nature analogies, so using biomimicry, fantasy, using individual ideation tools like brain writing, wild idea tools to prompt free association and different lateral thinking tools. 
Um, and I think that the headline here is twofold. One, be clear on what you're seeking to achieve. And then the second thing is select a variety of techniques and tools because some will really resonate for some people, but not for others. So we want to give people a menu to choose from. Now, the fourth point here is quite a brief one, and it's about building creative thinking capacity. And that's really about strengthening the creative problem solving muscles of your team. And there's three quick points here. The first is give your team a clarity or a metacognition and awareness of the process they're embarking on. First, we'll be thinking divergently and then convergently. And that's great, right? Because people can then relax into the process. They're clear on what's happening. And you're also building their creative muscles and helping them understand the importance of thinking divergently and convergently. And, you know, hopefully those are skills and that's an awareness they'll take into other projects in the business. The second point is introducing the best practice divergent and convergent thinking behaviors and particularly for divergent thinking behaviors, giving people a practical experience of them. And then making sure you reinforce those behaviors. So I often see people when I'm observing other folk running ideation sessions, they do a good job perhaps of landing the behaviors, but then they don't reinforce them and people fall into a uh, path of least resistance habits and we lose that great focus on thinking divergently, guided by best practice and of course that impacts on the quality of outputs. Now the fifth area to explore is the creative climate. It doesn't happen by accident, it happens by design. And really what we're seeking to do here is nurture and energizing an environment so people feel relaxed, they're able to explore and play with ideas and really relax into the process. So there are five factors here to take into account. Um, and this is from a piece of work I've done on creative climate uh, and their contribution at plays to getting to great ideation that delivers every time. So the five headlines here are, the first is around safety. So creating a uh, sense of psychological safety. And the reason why that's important is it means people will take risks and they'll freely explore new possibilities. The second point here is around, around creating a sense of challenge, that just right tension. Uh, so people are, have skin in the game, they're really motivated, and this is important because it helps activate cognitive flexibility and persistence. And cognitive flexibility and persistence are the two most important factors for creativity. The third point is around anticipation. We want to signal that this event will be different, it will be interesting, and we want to create a sense of cognitive arousal. And then the fourth point is around momentum. We want to create a sense of progress and meaningful achievement, which helps sustain people's motivation levels. And then finally, the effective skill that's most important when we're thinking ideationally is playfulness. It encourages curiosity, and what it does is it reduces our level of inhibition, which means we're more open to exploring new connections and new combinations. So these are the five factors we've talked through, creating the space for deep thinking, embracing diversity, designing for a shift in perspective, building creative thinking capacity, and nurturing the creative climate. And what we've done is there's a checklist, as I mentioned, that we're going to um, send out in advance. And so we're going to end uh, with talking, as I promised, very briefly about virtual and how does this differ for virtual. And the headline here is that the fundamentals are exactly the same, but there's just a couple of things we want to dial up. So 
the very first thing is we need to pay some extra attention to logistics to make the technology seamless. So much as we've done today, we have a dedicated person taking care of technology. You cannot lead and facilitate attention, uh, facilitate a session and give that the energy and the headspace it needs and also be taking care of technology. It just, it doesn't work. There's something around setting clear expectations of how it works, the platforms you'll be using, so people know what happens when and where. There's also something about establishing behaviours. So, for example, if we're running a workshop on Zoom, one of the really important behaviours is we're here to collaborate. Everyone has their cameras on so we can see each other. Teams who can see each other collaborate better and we reinforce that behaviour. If we do need to upskill people on any platforms in advance, we take care of that before the session begins so everyone's feeling capable and confident. And of course, we always have plan B workarounds. And then finally, in terms of nurturing the creative climate, we really want to accentuate the positives that virtual is going to offer for us. The fact that we are able to join from more convenient locations, have team members perhaps dialing in from different places around the UK or maybe around the world. And we also need to remember to humanize the experience, to make everyone feel part of something bigger and to ensure they feel heard and valued. So, you know, just as we would at the start of a face-to-face -face workshop where we're chatting over coffee at the start of the session, how was your day, how, how did travel here go, plans for the weekend, you know, we can still have that great relaxed environment at the start of a session. Um, and it serves to help humanize the experience. So as I mentioned, there is a checklist that we'll be distributing um, after this session, which calls out a lot of the points that we've covered off today. So um, at this point, um, I'll mention, you know, if there are projects you're thinking about in the future that you're interested in talking about, please just reach out. You know, I'm always very happy to have a conversation about what you're thinking about doing and, you know, also give you an honest appraisal. Is it something that, you know, the team at 8 Innovation can help add any value to? So always very happy to do so. And our contact details are there. So, Bali, let me pass over to you. I'm curious to see what sort of questions we've got to jump into. Coral, first of all, can I just say, I mean, massive thanks. And, and I, I, I hope, I'm sure, uh, all those uh, on, uh, on this presentation will agree. This is, wasn't just a presentation. This, this was a masterclass on, on ideation. Uh, and thank you for giving us the gift of the checklist, which is going to go into our... Um, into our innovation toolkit. I mean, this is the perfect place for it. So we'll move on, move on very quickly to Q&A. Uh, just a reminder, you can submit it, submit questions and upvote questions in the, uh, click the button on the, the bottom of your screen. Um, so let's start with, uh, we've got quite a few actually. Uh, I'll ask the first one. Um, right, so, Hold on, they keep moving on my screen. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, how important is the physical environment in which the ideation session is taking place? Uh, and, and what are the factors that you, we need to consider? Great, and that's a, that's a really important question. And I think, you know, when we're talking about creative climate, the, there are really two dimensions to that. And one is that sense of psychological safety and challenge, anticipation uh, that we've talked about, and of course, the sense of momentum and playfulness. And you're right, the other, when we're running something face-to-face, -face, is the physical environment. And I think a couple of the headlines there would be that ideally we're taking people out of their normal work environment. That's a really important trigger for the fact this is not just business as usual, sitting down at our desks, engaging in the sort of normal thinking that we might. Um, this is actually a different endeavor and we want to think differently and be engaged in different ways. So if you can go off site, do. 
in the event you've not got the budget to do so, what can you do with the room? Can you dress that uh, consumer unmet needs, posters, stimulus on the wall to make it a more engaging environment? and avoid the tyranny of the colossal boardroom table, um, which is just simply a recipe for, for um, turning off people's level of collaboration often, I find. Um, so yes, do put thought into the physical environment. It's, it sends some really important triggers. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I've experienced both the boardroom. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> um, moving on, there's another great question that is, again, I have felt the pain many times. So what tips can you offer for managing those people that want to, I, I'll just pop in and out of the ideation session? Yeah, yeah. So in, I, in, in a nice way, clearly, and a respectful way, because <laughs> yeah. I can think of lots of other ways. <laughs> I think there's something here about setting clear expectations. Um, and I think the very first point I made when we're talking about creating space and time is we need 100% focus. So when you're engaging with stakeholders, land that point and reinforce it and, and be realistic. And if people are saying, well, you know, I just like to sort of join this bit and that bit, I say, look, thank you, really appreciate your support. But actually what we find happens is when we have people popping in and out, it takes away the focus of the group, takes time for you to catch up. Let's look at some other ways we can get your input um, and feedback into the process and engage them more positively. Um, I think the temptation is, you know, perhaps in all of us, we seek to be people pleasers and say, yeah, no problem. It'll be fine. It won't. We know it won't be fine. So I think we've just got to stand um, fast there. And people in my experience, respect you when you say, look, we want to create the right environment. We know we need 100% focus. That's okay if you can't give that. There's other ways that you can contribute. I think that's a, actually, thank you for that, because that's this last bit. There are other ways you can contribute so they don't feel like, you know, you're pushing them away. That's, I, I, I'll make a note of that. <laughs> right, next question, next question. So can you give some examples of some of the creative stimulus you have used that have given the best results and that participants mm -hmm. just really enjoyed using? So when I'm thinking about creative stimulus, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of some of the things I find always, always work. So number one is really great clarity on consumer unmet needs. So what can we provide in terms of insights? And I mean real insights, not 67% of people do X. That's not an insight. When we're talking about insights, we're talking about deep, fundamental human motivations. So insights, unmet consumer needs, pains, gains, consumer narratives, um, a day in the life of a consumer map mapping out their um, pain points and, and magic moments as they're referred to. So that's the first bucket. Uh, what do we know about consumers? The second bucket I find useful is outside world stimulus. So stretching people's thinking beyond our category and often a couple of things I think actually three I'll give you three three things that I think work really well here one is inspiring examples from other categories um, so what can we learn from automotive or paint or or healthcare you know things outside of our categories where brands are responding to similar unmet consumer needs but doing so in really innovative ways and that does a couple of important things it gets our thinking out of our own category um, and that enables us sometimes to think a bit more freely and of course, it gives us inspiration and sparks ideas. A second thing to do there is giving people practical experiences. So they have a visceral experience of what consumers are going through or the experiences consumers have or how other brands solve these issues. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to suffer from almost a version of death by PowerPoint. If we're reading lots of stuff on screen, it's easy to feel sort of one step removed. But when you're out there and you're getting the dirt under your fingernails and you're in a sweaty, stressful situation like consumers are, 
that visceral reaction is really powerful. Another thing to bear in mind, can you bring in provocateurs, as I mentioned, using the example of the Functional Foods Project, where we used nutritionists, we used um, a biohacker, um, people who will help us think outside of our own category. So that's the second bucket, um, outside world thinking. And the third, I think that's often interesting, is kind of looking within your own cupboard, if you will, from a science and technology uh, perspective. What are either platforms you have or technologies or capabilities or perhaps trends in science and technology that might help spark fresh thinking? Actually, that is that is a, a good point because we often, uh, as technologists, um, we clearly have got uh, inputs from from other from areas that other members of, of a business will not have. And I think actually, thank you for that, Coral, because it is important that, that we bring that in. Um, and also, by the way, the, the example you, you gave us, the, the uh, use uh, in, inspirational examples from other categories, you've just reminded me, I, I did that um, last academic term with my students. We did a brainstorm, they had run out of ideas, they said, this is it, there's no more, no more. I said, okay, okay. So just to prove a point, I said, I, I gave them that, and my gosh, they just started creating ideas again. Yeah. And they said, you know, <laughs> there's method in the madness. Um, <laughs> right, let's check the time. It is, I'm afraid, it is, it is uh, one minute to 12. So I know we've got some more questions, but unfortunately, um, we'll, we'll have to close the Q&A here. Um, we've also got uh, members, you know, the audience saying thank you very much um, uh, for, for this masterclass, because it was indeed a masterclass. Uh, so Coro, again, big thanks. Thanks everyone to those, uh, big thank you to those that attended uh, the webinar uh, today. Uh, you can always um, uh, contact Coro uh, directly. Her details are on the screen. Uh, uh, so you can you will get the webinar and the checklist uh, via uh, uh, email. Uh, you can also find it at the the webinar uh, the IFSD's webinar hub. Uh, before we we log off, um, uh, please fill in. Uh, you log off. Please fill in the the survey that will pop up as by magic uh, on your screens. So. Um, all that, uh, that remains is to thank you, Coral, again. Thank Robin behind the screen. You've made this happen. So big thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone again. Have a great December. I have to say, have a great Christmas break as well, because it's not that far away. And goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>